Well, we said we'd be right back again, and here we are, right back again. So we're going to move right on. Uh, the the million dollar question, of course, is the one that everybody's asking, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask for them since they're not able to do it to you, Mel. And that is okay. Okay. So we don't have any reference for the Dome of the Rock in the seventh century. So when does this finally come? When does this dome? When do we finally hear about it? That the book, the the building that we're looking at today. When does that actually? come into fruition can you help us with that out with that over to you yeah it's yeah so it's literally at the the very end of the the ninth century so we're talking about um the latter years of the ninth century we have uh, a witness count in 870 that places a building in the northern part of the temple mount but then finally we get a mention of a dome of the rock built over the rock foundation in the last few years of the ninth century practically the 10th century um so it is incredibly late okay well you're going to actually introduce some more material taken from aj deuce's uh well-written article that is uh, up online and those of you can get it on pdf the serpent king and uh, this uh, this is causing a huge amount of furore around the world a lot of people have been sending it to me uh they've been asking me to critique it i said we have a guy mel who is actually going through and is unpacking it those of us who don't have the time to read all of J.J. Deuces, thank you, Mel, for doing that for us. Since what you're doing is you're introducing, you're bringing his research from what he has done over the years, and now you're showing it to us. Because this has a huge amount of impact on what we've been saying concerning that standard Islamic narrative and how they got it wrong. Because everything we've known about the Dome of the Rock, everything we've known about the early scripture has come from the standard Islamic narrative, the S-I-S-I-N. And unfortunately, as we're seeing in almost every category, they are fraudulent. So we've gone back to the seventh century. We're back in the seventh century and we cannot find this building. Well, there is a tower there. We even have possibly a picture of this tower uh, that's 100 feet high and maybe 50 feet wide, but it's in the right place. But it may not even be in the right place that we have today. It may be off to the left over towards the eastern wall. And now you're telling me that we don't still even have any reference to this structure called the Dome of the Rock. You're saying it may have been introduced in the ninth century. I want to hear more of what you have to say, because obviously I want to see what the history is telling us, not what the standard Islamic narrative is telling us, not what Muslims have been telling us. I want to see what history tells us. So over to you. Okay, let me just go back here. So if we just reiterate where we left off in the last video, we, we had an image of, of uh, the temple in a Bible by Charlemagne. And it was basically just a tower. There was no arcades. And what is the significance of that? Well, if this was what Abdul al-Malik made, where are the arcades? If we don't have arcades, it means we have no inscriptions. If we don't have inscriptions, then really we've thrown away the main anchor that we have in terms of determining the, most of the early history of Islam. However, the Zukwin Chronicles suggest little remained by the time of Caliph Mansur, of what was called Solomon's Temple. So basically the key takeaway from this is that Al-Mansur turned the temple into a mosque. But when was that? Well, in the middle of the eighth century. So AJ Juice says the lineup of primary evidence continues with the Zukkin Chronicle of the late eighth century. It makes no mention of the Dome of the Rock when referring to restoration going on in the ruins of Jerusalem. Instead, the Chronicle seems to try to say that whatever may have been on the Temple Mount had not been used as a mosque until Al-Mansur. So what does that tell you, Jay? <laughs> because we've got some serious problems there. Okay, um, so we're going from a temple to a mosque, and this is not till the mid eighth century. That, from everything we've known about what was happening in the 7th century, it, and it looked like that this was an internecine conflict between anti-Trinitarians and Trinitarians, many different sectarian Christian groups, Jews as well, but nothing Islamic and nothing that would be in the form of a mosque. So here now, what you're telling me is that this whole conflict that is happening in the, look at the dates, mid 8th century, at that time, then uh, Islamic imposition is now being put onto what was earlier a temple. And of course, temple mean a Christian temple. Absolutely. So the key thing from the Zukkan Chronicle is, he says, he turned the temple, referring to al Mansur, he turned the temple into a mosque because the little that remained of Solomon's temple became a mosque for the Arabs. He repaired the ruins of Jerusalem. 
So if we are looking for evidence of the Dome of the Rock, well, the Zuckin Chronicle doesn't give us that evidence. Um, it doesn't seem like there was much remaining of whatever was there from Abdul al-Malik's time. And if there was very little remaining, really, is there much chance of there being inscriptions? Um, is there much chance of the mosaics being there? So like what we've been led to believe is we've got a pristine preservation of the mosaics, the inscriptions, pretty much everything on the, the inner arcade. And yet, contrary to that, a really early witness, the Zuckin Chronicle says that very little remained of it. Um, so that doesn't really um, bode well for the argument that, um, that the inscriptions are from the 7th century. But it gets worse. How can a temple be turned into a mosque, as the Zutkin Chronicle says, if there already was supposed to be an Abdul al-Malik era inscription proclaiming Islam and Muhammad? Logically, it had to be a mosque to have such an inscription. So what we've got is we've got a major chronological problem. So the Zutkin Chronicle is saying to us, it was a temple, and then in the mid-8th century, it got turned into a mosque. And yet there is an inscription that seems to proclaim an Islam that hadn't yet happened. It's claim, claiming to be a mosque when it was just a temple, you know, 50 years before the time of Al-Mansur. So we got major problems here. Um, and if, if I have to go with um, two competing witnesses, I would have to go with the mid 8th century uh, witness account here. Now, it, it continues. This one building was first a synagogue and was in the northern part of the Temple Mount. AJ Juice says, is it certain that the Temple of Solomon is referring to the dome and not another building on the mount? To fixate the dome or the inscriptions onto Al-Malik, this primary evidence would have to be ignored. From the understanding that something else, a temple, had been converted into a mosque follows that there were, were not possibly Muslim inscriptions before said conversion. Moreover, the chronicle appears to mention just a single building, not two. Besides, I will below show that this one building was probably situated in the north of the Temple Mount. Logic of the primary evidence commands that the Sufyanid monument to the east of the Temple Mount had been raised, while the Temple of Solomon may be the Marwanid synagogue. If, we, if you think back to our last episode, I mentioned that A.J. Juice believes that there were two separate buildings, which he referred to as Safa and Marwa, which are the Sufyanid monument and the Marwanid um, synagogue in this case. Let me just jump in here, go back, just to help people know who we're talking about. The, under the Umayyad Caliphate, there were two families. One was called the Sufyanid family, who came into power from 661. Mu'awiyah was a Sufyanid and continued up until Abdul Malik took over in around 680. Some say 685, roughly 680. could be Marwan the first, but there's much dispute as to who is the first. It depends. The Germans think it was Abdul Malik, and he was from Merv. Marwan means from Merv. Merv is way up in Turkmenistan. They then took over power. They were still the Umayyads, but they were another uh, competing family within the uh, within the Umayyad dynasty. So they take into power, and Abdul Malik is... Possibly their first or the, certainly the greatest of all the Marwanid families. So you're saying that Sufyanid, which would be on the eastern side, near the eastern wall, it would be their structure. And the Marwan, Marwa was referring to Marwanid, which makes sense because it, it reflects the name of the family itself. Yep. So he, he goes on to say that the traveler, Bernard the monk, visited the holy city around 870 AD and wrote that the Temple of Solomon is in the north, which houses a Saracen synagogue. It is remarkable that Bernard recognized the building as a synagogue. Christian monks do not usually get confused about such fundamental terminology. Moreover, he places the synagogue to the north of the platform, while the Dome of the Rock sits dead center on the north-south axis and offset to the west. What he's, AJ Juice is saying is that the place that he puts it does not match the Dome of the Rock. Okay, to place the rock to the north, 
His, his description requires that the entire northern half of the platform would have to be built after his visit. Um, so essentially, this is really damaging on multiple levels. Um, first of all, we've got a building in the wrong location. And the fact that it's been referred to not as a mosque, but as a Saracen synagogue. So it's, it's basically revealing quite a lot for us. It's suggesting that there is a Jewish connection in the early days of Islam, and that visitors could be forgiven in confusing a mosque with a synagogue, which suggests a strong Jewish influence in those early years. Um, AJ Juice goes on to say that he is surprised about the openness of the secret, not about the fact that it was a synagogue. Academics should perhaps take his report more seriously it's primary evidence for a temple of Solomon for Saracen Jews on the Temple Mount. It was perhaps the only building up there. Together with the Zuckwin Chronicle, it appears that the Temple of Solomon was indeed a synagogue in the north of the Temple Mount and that the foundation stone may not have been covered with a major monument. Presumably, if that tower that is mentioned earlier had existed, it no longer existed when this monk visited. He he didn't mention any other building apart from this building in the north. Had Abdul al-Malik's Dome of the Rock with gold on the roof existed, he surely would have mentioned it, but he doesn't. Um, and I think this is really damaging. It means that there was no Dome of the Rock yet. There was no inscriptions. There was no arcades. There was no mosaics. There was none of that. We have to wait a little bit longer before we see a Dome of the Rock mentioned. Do you want to comment on that before I go oh, further? I mean, this is... This is putting everything out of whack, and uh, it's fascinating that you have you would we would expect to see Saracen Jews who would have all, everybody wants the dome of the, 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 the Temple Mount because that is where David's temple was. That is where the first century temple was destroyed. Uh, the Jews would, had been thrown out of Jerusalem. They've all wanted to come back and get to the Temple Mount. That's why Umar, as we you and I have discussed many times, Umar wanted to get back to Jerusalem. He came from Hira uh, in Iraq, came across, and finally conquered Jerusalem in 638, and Sophronius gives him the key to the city. And so that's why we have in 638 that reference to him going up and building that structure. But here we are, we're now, we're talking about a good 150 years later, we're talking about 870, the ninth century, when you have a eyewitness account, and the eyewitnesses are saying that this is nothing more than a synagogue a synagogue, not the Dome of the Rock, not the structure we're looking for, not the one that's there today, not the one we've been told has been there since, since 669, uh, 691. We're now 870. We're almost 200 years later. We're almost coming up to 200 years later, the late 9th century, and it's still nothing more than a synagogue for Saracen Jews sitting up in the northern part, not in the central part where the rock is, nor in the eastern where the Sufyani building would have been earlier. So this is fascinating because this is pushing it back even further. The significance of that will open up and show you once we get to the conclusion. But I want to hear what you what more you have to say. Yeah. So obviously, if they they go about building a dome of the rock, they're going to have to create a new narrative in the the latter part of the ninth century. No problem, as you as we'll see, they create a new narrative out of thin air, and I'm sure it may have raised eyebrows for the first decade or two. But the, the amazing thing about narratives is that it. It affects the communal memory of the population. So people receive the narrative and they go, okay, that's it. That's that's the story. Because most people are busy with their lives. They don't have time to investigate histories like people like me or you. Uh, Can I give you an example right now? Yeah. Let me give you an example. When you go to Mecca today, and you look at the... the um, the Jamaats, Jamaats, we call them the Jamaats. These are the Jamaats. These are the pillars. The one pillar that has been there all the way through up until the 1980s. In the 1980s, and I remember talking to Al Fadi about this. Al Fadi's parents, whenever they went to the Mecca, there was only one pillar there. And here's a picture of the one pillar. I'm just going to put it up here right now. This is the picture of the one pillar that all the pilgrims throw stones at. Now, after 1980, and this is what Abdul Fad uh, Al Fadi remembers when he went as a young boy, there were three pillars, three pillars that he throws on. Here's a picture of the three pillars. If you go today, they're now all enclosed. They, you, here's a picture of what they look like now today. Now, what has happened? That one pillar was to be stones thrown at the devil. 
Now that because there's so many pilgrims that have come, they now have to enlarge it to three pillars to accommodate the millions that come there. All the stones that are being thrown are being hitting people, so they've got to enclose it so that none of these stones hit anybody. And now what do they do? There's a whole new narrative. What's the new narrative? These are three temptations by, of, of Abraham by Satan. Not one temptation, but three. So it's enlarged from one to three temptations. And I said, Al-Fadi, doesn't anybody get that something's going on here? He said, you know, I never thought of that. I never thought through that what my parents had always knew as one temptation, and that's why you throw it through that, has now been enlarged to three temptations to accommodate the crowds. If that has happened since the 1980s, we're talking about only 40 <laughs> years. If it can happen in the 21st century and no one make qualms about it, can you then understand why they didn't say th much? And if they did say much, they didn't go very far back in the ninth century. Yeah, the thing with propaganda of any kind is basically if if people trust the people who produce the propaganda, so obviously that's that's a precondition. You know, people trust the propaganda, they don't question it, and they wear the ideas like new clothes. And if someone that they look up to and trust says, you know, this is what happened, you just go, yeah, okay, that's it. And any questions you have in the back of your mind was, well, well, there must be an explanation for it. Maybe I don't get it. I'm not as smart as, the, as these wise people who know what really happened. So that's really what happened. People just shrugged their shoulders and it became fact. Why does no one report seeing a dome of the rock on the Temple Mount? Before al Mamun, the dome of the rock appears to be invisible. After an alleged enlargement, there was a synagogue. Although absence of evidence is no evidence of absence. Here we are not dealing with some obscure detail of fact, but with one of the most important buildings for all Judaic religions and inscriptions for Islam. No Jew took note, no Christian, no Muslim, no body, no soul. It's a really strong point. So latter half of the ninth century, we're still not seeing any mention of the Dome of the Rock, and that is very suspicious. It's really suggested there simply was no Dome of the Rock there yet, but it will be finally mentioned at the time that the, the new building was built, or at least a few years after it was built. Okay, when do we finally get a dome at the right location? Um, and so this is the, the, the earliest witness we have. In the late ninth century, the Sunni historian, Jogfer Yakubi, who died in 897, 898, so it must have been built in the previous 30 years approximately. He mentions in his, his report, which is entirely fictitious, he says, then Abdul al-Malik built above the Sakra a dome. And he goes into more detail, but this is pure fiction. The Dome of the Rock must have been built after 870, and so they had to backdate this story to basically explain away this sudden appearance of the dome. Um, I'm sure for the first couple of decades, people might have scratched their heads uh, and wondered about this. But once time has passed, a couple of decades, um, maybe one generation passes by, it just, as the same with um, the pillars that you mentioned, it just became accepted. Um, a very late contemporary evidence that a building now covers the rock. The inadmissible traditions of both historians Yakubi and Bukhari contain passages that claim that Mecca was forbidden or later destroyed, providing a reverse reasoning for the dome's construction. It seems possible that the structure was not standing in the 770s or, late, or lay in ruins and that mosaics were absent toward the end of the ninth century. Yet it is the first contemporary primary evidence that a building now covers the rock and that the efforts in forming communal memory was focused on attributing a structure to al-Malik that could only have stood for a few decades at the most. So what he's saying is essentially what I've, what I've said earlier is that there's an attempt now to create a narrative that will form the communal memory, um, explain away how this suddenly appeared only just two decades before. Now, the key thing with all of this is there couldn't be the inscriptions until at least the dome was built. In short, the first prototype of, for the Dome of the Rock was built between 870 and 897 AD, precisely when tradition starts to creating a new communal memory. 
Therefore, neither Abdul al-Malik's dedicatory inscription nor al-Mamun's correction could have existed before that time. And for me, that is explosive news. We have a first description of the Dome of the Rock that resembles the building as it stands today at the middle of the Haram area. It does not tell us that it is octagonal or that there are inscriptions, but at least it tells us that there is a dome. This is in the year 903 AD, Ibn al-Faqi al-Hamadani provides for the first eyewitness account that there was a platform leading up to the Dome of the Rock. I'm just going to read the, the bit that's in red. The edifice of the dome is covered with white marble and its roof with red gold. In its walls and high in the drum are 56 windows, glazed with glass of various hues. Each me measures six L's in the height by six spans across. The dome, which was built by Abdul al-Malik ibn Marwan, is supported on 12 piers and 30 pillars. It consists of a dome over a dome, that is an inner and an outer, on which are sheets of lead and white marble. To the east of the dome of the rock stands the dome of the chain. Now, th the problem with all of this is, as we saw, there was a monk that visited the site in 870. Is it possible that a monk could have gone on top of the Temple Mount, saw a synagogue in the north, and somehow mysteriously didn't see a golden dome right there in the middle of the Temple Mount? That's what we're expected to believe. So I think this is highly suspicious that this is um, a fabrication that has been written to um, explain where the Storm of the Rock has suddenly come out of. So in conclusion, our earliest reference to a Dome of the Rock, i.e. a dome over the Temple Mount Foundation is in the late ninth century. Multiple witness reports that prior to this, there was a mosque at the Eastern Gate, and then there was a Saracen synagogue at the northern end of the Temple Mount. There is a possibility that a tower existed for a time over the rock, if the codex can be reliably interpreted that way. But even still, doesn't, that doesn't have any arcades which are where the crucial inscriptions are located. The evidence would suggest that the dome is a 9th century creation and that the inscriptions, including a dedication to Abdul al-Malik, can't be from the 7th century. And there I conclude. Well, okay. Now, let's put it all together. I don't think there's much I need to say. I think you've done such a good job here. You have really encapsulated. But let me just say one thing. Remember, um, Mel, why was the dome so important? Why are these inscriptions so important? Well, these inscriptions are the first time that we really see the Shahada. Remember, we don't have the Shahada in any structured form until the Dome of the Rock. Now, and that's La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulallah. That means there's only one God but God. And there's Al Sharkatun is also in there. Remember, Al Sharkatun, which means there is no associates. And Muhammad, or the Muhammad, the blessed one, the praised one, is the nothing more than a messenger of God. So that's why the Shahada, though it's not the Shahada we have today, it's still a Shahada that it was introduced in the Dome of the Rock, 691. That's what we've always thought. So there you have the reference to the Shahada, you have the reference to Muhammad. Further on, you also have reference to Muslims. Those are the three things we've been looking at because we su suggested these were introduced at the time of Abdul Malik. Not a Muslim Shahada, nor a Muslim Muhammad, nor a Muslim the people, because we didn't, at this time, these were just being formed. Nonetheless, it was such an important structure for this, was it not, Mel? Yeah, this is, is the primary evidence that Muslims have to prove that there was an Islam in those early years. And you throw out this evidence, what have they got? You know, they haven't got really solid evidence until much later for the existence of Islam. And two centuries later, you're talking between 870 and 897. That is even after, that's even after Ibn Hisham, that's after al wakiri this is after Al-Buhari, after Sahih Muslim. I mean, you're talking in the first re really description of it is not till 903. So you're coming into the part similar to where Al-Tabri would have been writing. So you're talking about when the standard Islamic narrative was being created is when this building is being put together. If we have to wait that late to get the Shahada, that late to get the Muhammad, and still a deformed Shahada, not the one that we use today, then there's all kinds of questions suddenly rise up. 
lots, all yeah. kinds of questions, because we're going to have to push everything back another two centuries. Because it's that, it's that, those inscriptions that are on the ambulatories that are the, the ones that we've always been going with, and they're ones that Muslims have been going with, and that everybody's been going with. But they did not exist in that earlier structure, even the earlier structure that's on that, that tower that you're talking about that could have been there during the time of Abdul Malik. Those don't have the ambulatories, which is where the inscriptions are from. There was a building yeah. there, but even that somehow got torn down and replaced with these two other structures, one on the east, one in the north, one for the Sufiani period, one for the Madwani period. And that, this, that, that, that not till really the ninth century, late ninth century we're talking about, and uh, that this finally got the building that we're looking at today. I would also point out that, you know, in that last description from 903 AD, there's irrelevant details about windows and sizes and so forth. What we're not seeing is any reference to an inscription. Surely the Shahada, a reference to Muhammad, would have been a big thing to include, even if a tiny part of the inscription, to mention it as part of the description, nothing about that. Nothing about the mosaics, nothing about that key inscription. It's incredible that it's not mentioned. And that's, I think, very damning. If there was that inscription there, that would have been massively important in terms of for propaganda purposes, if, if for no other reason to mention that, and it's not mentioned. Good stuff, man. This is going to have an awful lot of impact. And of course, we're going to be doing even more yet because there's more yet to come. But uh, these are the first two. We want to get into this. We want to introduce this. We'll be coming back later and unpacking what we now know from the 15th and 16th and the 17th century up until even the 19th century because there's much more yet to unpack. But that should get you all going. And that should you start to see uh, that we are doing we're doing what we've asked, we, what has been asked of us, and that is find out what's really happening historically, follow the evidence on the ground. And as the evidence keeps moving, and as we see from the 7th century up until the 8th, up until the 9th century, the evidence that Mel has come up with is damaging an enormous amount of the standard Islamic narrative. Uh, we're not surprised by that. Uh, we have put, as we've been sifting it through, we've been putting the Dome of the Rock in here, and what's been coming out is nothing more that looks like Sufyani and Marwanid structures, even possibly a synagogue, but not the Dome of the Rock as we need it. When we've been looking at the inscriptions, we thought the inscriptions were Quranic. I thought they were Quranic until today. We're finding out they're not even Quranic. And certainly, if they are Quranic, they're not from the right time period that the Quran and here's the thing, already put together. Here's the thing as well, is if the inscriptions are as late as I'm going to suggest in later parts, and we, it's, it's been subject of debate why they don't match exactly the chronic verses that we have today it suggests that these people who put them there may have intentionally made them different from the chronic verses so as not to raise suspicions because that all, all adds to the authenticity the fact that it's a bit rough at the edges not quite the chronic verses close enough but not quite it gives the the impression of uh, it being archaic this is the level of deception that seems to be suggested by the evidence. Um, I, I do also want to, to, to actually uh, add the, the fact that all, all credit for all this work is AJ Juices. It's, this is me just reporting what he has found. Good. Great. Thank you. Listen, you do have some reactions. I'm sure you want to respond right here at the bottom. Go ahead and put, put down on your comments and Good friend Mel will look at your comments and he'll get back to you. You will, Mel, and you'll try to un unpack or get, uh, certainly respond. If there are lots of good comments that need to be responded to, Mel and I will do another follow-up uh, video to be able to answer those questions. Well, until that time, then, this is Mel over here, thousands of miles away, and Jay over and out. <music>